A good morning. That's pretty good. Pretty good, guys. Y'all are getting tired of me doing that whole spiel about. Yeah, Mike's like, yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> Opening prayer this morning will be led by Ethan Luffman. Closing prayer by Brother Wilton Cherry. I'd like to welcome you to the Dover Church of Christ. Thank you for coming in and worshiping with us. If you're a visitor, know that you are an honored guest, and we invite you back anytime you are in the area. Also, if you don't mind, if you're a visitor, there's visitor cards on the back of pews. If you don't mind, fill one of those out and drop it in the collection plate on your way out today. Our sick list. Um, Miss Marianne Cherry, Wilton's wife, she will be having back surgery Monday and Wednesday um, to uh, correct some issues there and remove some old hardware. So again, she's having two back surgeries, so keep her in your prayers. Also, uh, she has Wilton's sister, Miss Merle, coming over to take care of Wilton, so keep Miss Merle in your prayers. Also, Miss Marianne's sister's son-in-law, Norbert Ebel. He has throat cancer. The prognosis is uh, maybe uh, somewhat grim, so please keep him in your prayers. There will be a meeting after services today, after we finish everything upstairs. Um, there will be a meeting in the basement. Also, you notice that the, uh, the parking lot was free from snow. If you see Amy Wallace, this is Edith Batten's daughter, Jody's sister. Uh, she arranged to have that done, so be sure to uh, express your gratitude to her. Also, there's several in the congregation that would like to thank Owen for going out and clearing uh, sidewalks and driveways, and I'm not all sure what he, what he cleared, but Owen and his magic shovel have been busy. So uh, let's uh, express our gratitude to Owen. Two weeks ago, we had a meeting in the basement. The results of that meeting, uh, Bible classes will begin uh, the first Sunday after the first of the month, next month, uh, Bobby will be heading that up. Uh, so Bible classes will begin. Also, we will, uh, after the first Sunday after the first of the month, we will return to having evening services on Sunday evening. And also, the first Sunday after the first of March, uh, we will have a room downstairs for those with the greatest concern health-wise, um, the services will be made available by video downstairs. So those with the greatest concern can take the greatest care downstairs, upstairs. Uh, the majority of people will meet. Uh, we ask simply that stand up, mask up. Uh, when you come in, take your mask off if you want. Um, if you're not want to wear a mask, kind of stay down towards the front. So, uh, and then the Comer Foundation. If you remember, uh, Mr. Comer, brother Comer, was a uh, businessman in Nashville, uh, very successful. And uh, at his passing, uh, he had a sizable uh, estate that he left to the Churches of Christ in Tennessee and Kentucky, I believe, and. Uh, we received a, uh, a benefit, a stipend, or what, what, whatever word she fits best, uh, after the initial uh, disbursement, uh, there were some churches that uh, were no longer established, or what have you, whatever the reasons there were, so they did a, a reallocation of remaining funds, and uh, our congregation received another $5,500, so... Um, be thankful for Brother Comer's gift. Um, certainly appreciated. Uh, that will be all of the announcements that I have, uh, and I'll turn the service over to Brother Jeff. There were no anniversaries or birthdays this week, so this time we'll have our opening prayer.
If you would bow with me, please. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and for all the many blessings of life that you give us. We're thankful, Father, for this opportunity to come here and to worship you as like-minded individuals and worship you in spirit and truth. And we pray, Father, that everything that we do today would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray, Father, for those that are have been mentioned that are sick, those that may be on our uh, sick list that uh, may be having surgeries, may be uh, not with us for whatever reason, Father, we pray that you would be with them and bless them and guide them and give them the things that they need uh, during this time, Father. We pray, Father, for uh, all those that are um, in military and uh, fire and rescue and EMS and police that are uh, serving our our country, Father, and we pray that you would be with them and give them the things that they need and, and uh, protect them in their duties, Father. We pray, Father, for uh, we thanking you for, uh, especially today, for your son Jesus who came to die on that cross for our sins, that through him we have uh, salvation and hope of eternal heaven with you one day. We pray, Father, that you'd watch over and care for us throughout this service, watch over and care for us throughout this week and and keep us safe, healthy, and out of harm's way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first song will be We Have Heard the Joyful Sound. <clears throat> we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves, bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves. Saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph. For the tomb, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This is our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Our next song will be Shall We Gather at the River. <clears throat> Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throng of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throng of God. On the margin of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river, 
the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. At the smiling of the river, mirror of the Savior's face, Saints whom death will never sever Lift their songs of saving grace Yes, we'll gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river That flows by the throne of God. This time we'll have a prayer for the offering. Let us bow. Grace and love in Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful that we can assemble here to worship Thee. Father, help us to realize that everything that we have comes from Thee. And Father, realize that You have blessed us with the income which we have. And Father, we're so thankful now that we have this opportunity to give back to Thee. Father, we pray that Your Word will be spread throughout this county and throughout the world. So, Father, we ask you now to forgive us over sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our song to help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper will be, He Loves Me. <clears throat> Why did the Savior have on leave and come to earth below? Where men his grace would not receive, because he loves me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Why did did the Savior mark the way, and why temptation know? Why teach and toll and plead and pray, because He loves me so. He loves me, He loves me, He loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. Why feel the garden's dreadful draws? Why through his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross because he loves me so? He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Let us bow while we give thanks. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day. We're thankful that we can assemble here. Father, we now have this opportunity to partake of this bread, which represents the broken body of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that we always partake of it acceptable unto Thee. And we are so thankful for that great sacrifice that He gave for us. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
despise him. Heavenly Father, we now offer thee our thanks for this cup, which represents the shed of blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we'll always partake of it except for one to thee. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next song will be when the roll is called up yonder. If you would please stand while we use this song. <clears throat> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome you to our service today. We are glad that you are here. We're glad that we are able to be here today. I'm thankful uh, for your presence. Anyone who might be visiting with us, we're especially always uh, welcoming to you. And uh, thank you. Welcome you to be back with us every opportunity that you uh, possibly have to be here. And uh, I was talking with uh, with Van before services. What are we gonna What are we gonna be able to do today with a uh, with the pandemic and snowpocalypse going on at the same time. And I think we did pretty good despite all of that. Thankful for those who helped to uh, to get the, the parking lot clear so that we could uh, be here also. I saw a lot of places had to cancel today because the parking lots were not accessible, and uh, that was not the case for us. So I'm very, very uh, thankful uh, thankful for that. If you have your Bible, go ahead and be turning it to uh, 1 John chapter 5, and we'll get to a verse uh, as a springboard verse there in just a moment. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. Don't forget, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're making your way out today uh, to uh, take your uh, Lord's Supper container, deposit those in the trash cans at the, uh, at the exit, so that Mr. Marty doesn't have to go through the building and, uh, and collect all of your COVID. Just go ahead and throw those away for us. But we're, uh, we're thankful for you helping us out with that. 1 John chapter 5. In a minute, uh, we'll get to verse number 13. want to look at some things under the heading of out with doubt, out with doubt. Your Bible tells us uh, these things are written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. That text is found for us, obviously, as we have before you today in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. You look at it and, and consider it and you notice that it's a verse that only has a little over 40 words in it, and so it's a very, very brief verse, a brief study, but in spite of the uh, brevity of it, 
what you'll notice is that there is, like many verses in the Bible, a tremendous amount of great material that's packed into a, uh, into a small passage. And what I want to do today by way of introduction is, is look at um, four things that I think are significant in that one verse to kind of set the stage for some points that I want to develop in just a moment. So these, these four, just, just by way of introduction from that verse, but look at it again. These things are written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. What do I notice about it? Well, I notice about it, first of all, by way of introduction, that the, the Bible affirms here the certainty of eternal life. And we need to see the, the, the reality of that, the absolute certainty of it. Notice that it says that you may know. Folks, they're talking about out with doubt. There is no doubt that is connected with that phrase right there. That you may know that you have eternal life. John wants us to know that eternal life is a reality, that it ought to be a certainty for the child of God. If we conduct ourselves in, in harmony with what it teaches here, there doesn't have to be any doubt about it. There doesn't have to be uh, any worries about this. And that, that's what I mean by out with doubt today when we get around to talking about that. that that's why we sing a song like, um, like Blessed Assurance. And when we sing the song, we don't do it with our fingers crossed. All right, It's not wishful thinking when we're singing that song. It's, it's not a song that we sing that, that the, uh, the title says uh, Blessed Assurance with a question mark at the end of it. There's, there's more to the certainty that is involved with what we have according to this verse. But not only the certainty, again, by way of introduction number two, there is also a reliability behind this eternal life that he talks about in, in the verse before us. A reliability. Notice that he says, these things have I, your Bible says, written. These things have I, an inspired apostle, written, written down as scripture to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. We have this recorded for us. It's before you right now in the pages of your inspired Bible. It is recorded there for us in, in God's Word. The most reliable document that has ever been produced. And it can be called that because it is the inspired, revealed will, mind of God that He has preserved for us. You, you think about what, what has come and gone since that verse was first penned by inspiration. You think empires have risen and fallen and yet that verse still remains. Nations have risen and fallen, and that verse is still in your Bible. Great leaders have come and gone, but that verse is still there just like it, it was 2,000 years ago. John 20, 30, and 31 says, and, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. There's a lot of things that Jesus was involved in and did that the... The, uh, the inspired writers under direction of the Holy Spirit didn't, uh, didn't see necessary to preserve for us. So, that are not written in this book. But he says, these are written. The things that we have, they were written down by inspiration. They, they were preserved. That you might know, that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life through His name. There, there is a reliability behind the eternal life that we find and can discover on the pages of God's Word. I saw recently where another large religious group out there voted and decided that they no longer believe that the Bible is the inspired, revealed will of God. They, they came out as a religious organization and, and said that basically the Bible's a good book that it ought to be studied and read, but that it's not something that's provided as far as the inspiration is concerned, as far as the revealed will and mind of God. That's, that's a thought that's out there. You would like to think that that's a thought that only exists among skeptics and atheists, but unfortunately it goes even beyond that. But those of us who are children of God who've actually studied the matter knows that there's, there's more to it than that. 
There is a reliability behind this eternal life that we can find in the Bible. That's what it means when the Bible says the Scripture cannot be broken. That's what it means when the Bible says that God who cannot lie promised before the world began. It is the inspired, revealed will of God. It is absolutely reliable. And so when I, when I look at this idea of out with doubt regarding the eternal life that's been provided for us, I, I think about some things and I, and I look at these verses. I think about the certainty of it that you may know. I think about the, rea rea um, the reality of it, the reliability of it, when I think about the fact that he said it's written. But then there's also a conditionality that, that is associated with this eternal life. And you can see the condition of it when he says, these things have I written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, there's, there's one condition that's mentioned there. And if you'll study your Bible as a whole and look what's required, what is asked of us by God, then you'll find out that there are a series of conditions that must be met if I want the result that is pictured as far as as eternal life is, is concerned. That word believe in our verse, those who believe on the name of the Son of God, that's a, that's a word that is in what is known as the present tense. Believe in the present tense. What, what that's suggesting is the word belief, the way it's used here, is not a one-time action and then you're done. This is a continual process. If you want the result, you've got to believe at one time in the past, and then you've got to keep on believing for the rest of your life. That's, that's the nature of the word here when it's in the present tense. It is not a one-time action. If you want the eternal life, then it's going to cost you the Christian life. The two are going to be associated together. That is the condition of having the result. Not only though a, a, a certainty, no. Not only a reliability, written, God's inspired word. Not only this conditionality, the idea that you've got to, to do what's right and continue to do it. But number four by way of introduction, there is a personality that is associated with all of this. And the personality, obviously, made very clear for us, for us to have eternal life, none other then the verse tells us, the Son of God. It is Our result of eternal life is absolutely tied to that one great and perfect personality who came down from heaven and took upon Himself human flesh. Our only hope is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. He left no room for doubt when it came to their salvation. He left no room for question marks when it came to where they could spend their eternity. And what I want to do today in a moment is, is I want to generate here three points regarding that to how we can be out with the doubt that is so prevalent in, in so many minds. And unfortunately, yes, sometimes I've even seen it happen in the Lord's church. It shouldn't be there. It doesn't need to be there. And we'll look, we'll look from the text at exactly why. Because listen, there are some things out there that, that can cause a person to question their salvation. And, and it genuinely should. And a, and a glance at 1 John helps with that. In fact, if I, if I, that, that, that verse before us, 1 John 5.13 is at the heart of why this book was written. That's what he tells us right there. And so he reveals to us some things that can help us to maintain the assurance, the confidence that, that we ought to have. Because um, you may, maybe this is apparently a problem for the first century Christians. The book was written to them for a reason. And it was preserved for me and for you for, for a great reason as well. It, it must have been the fact that that's why 1 John 5.13 was written and, and, and included in the Bible. And so all through this little great inspired book, you have him convincing these Christians there doesn't have to be question marks associated with your Christianity. 
There doesn't have to be doubt associated with what you believe and, and why you believe it and what it is that you're doing and the result that's going to come. Several, several ideas that he lays out that ought to help us with this concept of really being out with doubt. What are they? Well, number one, you want to be out with doubt. Never doubt, according to our text, the promises of God. Never doubt God's promises. Anybody ever promised you something and went back on their word? It has happened to every one of us. It's happened to me. And you know what? Here's the honest and solid truth of it. I've been guilty of it myself. I've said things that I either did not or could not keep whatever it was that I said. I don't want to be like that. And I want to, I want to be better than that. But what we understand is as long as you've got to deal with people, that's going to happen from time to time. Someone makes a commitment and then they're, they're for whatever reason not able or maybe not willing to follow up with that commitment and, and we get disappointed by that. And if it's a serious enough thing, we can be broken by that. But it's, it's a reality of our existence that unfortunately we get all too used to and then unfortunately sometimes we carry over into the realm of that which is spiritual and we should not. I'll tell you this, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We've been studying about the Godhead on, on Wednesday night. I hope that you've been following along in that study. Um, we're going we're gonna to plan to have one more a related topic on the Holy Spirit, Lord's will, this coming Wednesday night. But uh, in looking at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the nature of God, I can tell you this, they will never go back on a promise. It'll never happen. It is against the very nature of what they are as deity to be able to do that. They will never never go back on a promise. They'll come through on every promise made 100 100% of the time. And that's why he tells us, you look, you're in 1 John 5, you look back at 1 John 2, 25, and uh, this is the promise that he has promised us even eternal life. Now notice, your eternal life, the Bible directly ties it. It is forever and separably linked to the promises of God. That's how powerful this idea is to being out with doubt. In, in 1 John 2, 25, he directly links the two. You can have eternal life, and the reason you can have it is because God is the one who's making the promise. No need to have any doubt. Titus 1, 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. That verse is at the heart of... Of, uh, of a lot of songs that we sing, but one specifically, standing on the promises of God. If you'll look in your songbook, and you don't have to do it right now, but I guarantee you that you can look in the index, follow the number, go back to it, and, and you will not find a copy in here that says questioning on the promises of God. It says standing on the promises of God. You sing it, you better believe it. And if you don't believe it, you got no business singing it. Because his promises are that real, they are that genuine. Now, what I'm this this next illustration on this one that I want to share with you is not original with me. I lifted it from one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite preachers of all time, um, Brother Wendell Winkler. But Brother Winkler often would say that the promises of God rest on four pillars. I've, I've, uh, I've referenced it before and I want to share it with you again. Um, I've always said on this that it would make a good sermon in and of itself and I, I, I want to do that sometime. But he, he said that the promises of God rest on four pillars. The fact that you can be out with doubt and tying this to our first point, what does that rest on? What do we know about God? What have we been studying about on Wednesday night when it comes to the Godhead? Well, first of all, it rests on God's omnipotence. Now, all that is is a, is a fancy word to say that God is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. But the promises of God rest on that pillar number one, God's omnipotence. In other words, God is powerful enough to carry out every promise He ever made. It's never going to be a problem where God made a promise, but then 
he was not strong enough or not powerful enough to carry out what he said he would do. Never going to be an issue because of pillar number one, the omnipotence of God. Pillar number two, the omniscience of God. Again, a fancy word to say that God is all-knowing. He has to be in order to be deity. It's one of the qualifications of being God. Omniscience. So pillar number two, because God is all-knowing, you never, never, never have to worry about God forgetting that He made the promise. Do you ever forget? Some of you may have already been guilty of forgetting something today. I've been guilty of leaving for the, for the worship service and didn't even take one of my kids with me. I've forgotten a kid at home, all right? And I've done it more than once. We forget things sometimes. You ever forget an anniversary? No? Better not. Birthdays, whatever it might be, we've forgotten things before. They can be less serious. They can be more serious. You start throwing that anniversary word around, you get in trouble. God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is that to a, to a divine sense there has never been a promise made by God that will not be kept because one day God will stand before us and say, oh yeah, I forgot that one. <laughs> Sorry, can't do it, y'all, I forgot. Will never happen. Two pillars so far. He is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. If he said it, he can do it. He's omniscient, all-knowing. If he said it, he's going to remember what he said. Pillar number three, God's omnibenevolence. And you know what that means. God is all loving. All loving. Because He is all loving, you never have to worry about Him breaking a promise. Not that He wasn't powerful enough, or not that He just forgot about it, but that He just didn't care and broke His word. You never have to worry about it. He is all loving, and you never have to worry about Him disappointing us and not carrying out a promise. And then number four, pillar number four, Brother Winkler would say, rests on the integrity of God. And that means, you know what integrity means, but when it comes to this, you never have to worry about it. His faithfulness will not let him lie to us. He's never, he's never going to deceive us. He's never going to say, you can have eternal life. It's, it's known, it's guaranteed, it's right there. We stand before him in judgment and he says, you know... Didn't mean it when I said it. Sorry. Out of luck. It's, like, it's against the nature of God. Those are the four pillars. Now you let that sink in. If I'm in the category of someone who is doubting God's promises, God's made a lot of them. Today we're talking about the promise of salvation. But if I'm in the category of a person who would doubt the promises of God when it comes to salvation, think about what I just did. What did, I, what did I just call into question? If I read 1 John 5.13 and then I come away and leave the idea that I don't believe it, that I can't really know that I have eternal life, what did I just do? I just drew, brought into question God's power, God's knowledge, God's love, and God's integrity, and I don't want to be a person who would question any of those. When He makes a promise you can take it to the bank every time. How can I really be out with doubt? I'll, I'll look at these lessons and I don't doubt the promises of God. Because, you know, somebody can lay some pretty serious charges at my feet, but it's a whole other situation to lay charges at the feet of God. I'm not going to doubt His promises. He made it. You can believe it. You want to be out with doubt? Number two, let me suggest this. Never doubt the forgiveness of God. Never doubt the forgiveness of God. Look at 1 John. Uh, probably the, a great verse on this one as far as this book is concerned. 1 John 1, 7. You all know it very well. We walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from every sin. And I know there's, there are a lot of people out there who have doubt when it comes to God forgiving their sins, and then therefore they have some associated doubt when it comes to eternal life. And it's a, uh, it's a sad cycle. I doubt God's forgiveness, and if I doubt God's forgiveness, then I'm going to doubt the eternal life that comes with it. 
And so often people feel guilty about something they've done. And when I live with a sense of guilt, we've talked about it before, it chokes out the assurance and the confidence that I ought to have that the Bible says that I should have. So you better believe that they are related. There's a, a, a correlation here. Folks, the lesson brought to us time and again from the Bible is to never doubt God's power to forgive any sin in my life. Did you hear it? Never doubt God's power. His willingness to forgive any sin in my life. I don't care how deep the sin is. I don't care how dark the sin is. One's equal to another when it comes to God's ability to forgive. Y'all, here's what it comes down to. If you are willing to do the hard work of repentance, He is willing to do the gracious work of forgiveness. Repentance can be hard. I've got to do what's right. I've got to own up to this. I've got to be honest about it. I have to, I have to deal with it and not, not hide it or deny it anymore. And there's this process of repentance. But when I do, He stands ready to forgive. I don't care what it was that you did or how many times you did it. Never doubt the power of God's willingness to forgive. Remind, and when I'm willing to do that, when I'm willing to do my part and I know He's going to do His part, it reminds me of Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. No sin is so great that it is beyond God's power to forgive if you're willing to repent. If you're willing to repent the forgiveness is there. So what causes doubt? And what cures doubt? Because we shouldn't have question marks on this and, and it'll help me if I remember not to doubt the promises of God and remember those four pillars about what those promises stand upon. Never doubt the forgiveness of God and if I'm willing to do my part, He has already left the light on and willing to unlock the door. I'm, I'm invited to come on in if I'm re ready to do my part. You want to be out with doubt, never doubt the love of God. Never doubt the love of God. Look at, um, go over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, and you look at the beginning of the chapter. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Now please don't uh, you know we're, we're, we can be I can be bad about we can be bad about passing over some words that we don't think about as being very significant in the Bible when we study it. You know we, we look at a verse like that and we think about sons of God and and um, love of the Father and and all of these great phrases Back all the way up to the very opening of verse number 1 right there. There's a word that is very powerful that we should not overlook and don't forget. The word is behold. Behold. The word behold literally means to stand back and really observe closely. Alright? Now, uh, Marty, if I were to come up to you and say, uh, hey, Marty, take a look at this. Yeah, he'd take a look, whatever it was. I might, I might be able to get his attention for something. But if I, if, Thomas, if I came up to you and I said, Thomas, behold. <laughs> All right, now I got your attention. That, that's, that's a powerful word. That's asking for something. It's not, you know, Marty carries on a conversation, kind of glances. Yeah, that's neat, Bobby. Passes, whatever. All right, behold. Now it has that idea of take a look, yes, but it's demanding more. It's, it's demanding your, your utmost attention. 
It's demanding your concentration. It's demanding your focus. And it's the first word of this verse. Now, what is he telling them to give their utmost attention and, and direct focus on and really, really take a look at? The love of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father has, when He says, Behold, don't just pass over it. Think for a moment about what He just asked us to do. Because it literally means stand back and really observe, closely follow, and take in the love that God has for us. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Look at verse 16. Hereby we uh, perceive the love of God because He laid down His life for us. Go to chapter 4, verse 8. He, he that loves not God, uh, knows, loves not, knows not God, for God is love. It's His very essence. Behold the very nature of who God is. His very essence. Doubting God's promises. Doubting God's forgiveness and doubting the love of God will cause me to lose confidence in my salvation every time. That's why it's repeated with such emphasis in this, in this great book. It's written for one reason, that we might know that we have eternal life. How can I be out with doubt? I've got, to, I've got to look at some of these ideas, really take them in. Folks, let me put it like this. The only one who should ever question their, their salvation, their assurance, their confidence is the disobedient. For example, the, the person who is not a faithful child of God. And so I ask you today, are you a child of God? Mark 16, 16 simply tells us, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the promise of God. When, when you obey, there's no doubt you become a Christian, and there shouldn't be any doubt about the salvation if you're a child of God. We've got, uh, now let's go ahead and call him out. we got one who's let me know we're going to have a uh, baptism today. Mr. Charles down here in the front row. We've been studying the Bible, and, and uh, he's decided today that he wants to put Christ on in baptism. Until you do that, you're outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no hope. In a little while, after services are over, for that young man, that doubt is gone. Doesn't have to have any more concern about it anymore. Baptism puts you into Christ. That's where there's life, that's where there's hope, and that's where the promises can be realized. Maybe somebody else today. Hey, I've already got the cover off. Let's go ahead and do this. Don't make me take it off twice. All right? If you need to obey the gospel, today's the day to go ahead and take care of it. We'd love to help. I'm joking about that. We'll do it twice if we have to, right, ma'am? All right. The only person in all the doubts is the person that hadn't obeyed. The other person who should have any doubt is the person who has abandoned the Christian life. Sometimes that, sadly, sometimes that happens too. And so it might be the case that we have someone who, who put Christ on in baptism, but, but they're, no, they're no longer faithful. They're not right with God. They need to do the hard work of repentance. The question marks are there until you get right again. Do you need to obey? We'd love to help. Do you need to come home? That's what home's for. If you need to respond, why don't you come right now as we stand and sing. While Jesus whispers to you, come, sinner, come.
while we are praying for you come sinner come now is the time to own him come sinner come now is the time to know him come sinner come are you to heavy laden come sinner come jesus will bear your burden come sinner come jesus will not deceive you come sinner come jesus can now redeem you come sinner come oh here is tender pleading come sinner come come and receive the blessing come sinner come while jesus whispers to you come sinner come while we are praying for you come sinner come thank you for being here today men don't forget about the business meeting after services please uh, our closing hymn will be save you like a shepherd lead us save your like a shepherd lead us much we need thy tenderest care in thy pleasant pastures feed us for our use thy folds prepare blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast bought us thine we Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us thine, we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us, Be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Early let us seek thy favor. Early let us do thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Let me say one thing before we go to the Father in prayer. Prayers are not to teach, but God promised us one thing. And we want to complain sometime about it. Genesis 8, 22, God said, While the earth remains, the four seasons will be here, 
Yes, there'll be snow, there'll be hot, there'll be a time of harvest, a time of, of planting, and all of those things. But the snow will melt, and then we can go out and mow the grass, put our wives on the weed eater and doing all that work. God blesses us, so we shouldn't complain. Let us thank God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we could be here today to worship Thee. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for every blessing that we have, realizing that all blessings come from thee. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the three Godheads, the way, they, the way everything is taken care of us. We thank thee for thy blessings for thy Son who died on the cross and shed his blood, that we may have remission and be added to thy kingdom, that we can see and wait on thee to come back and see our name in that Lamb's Book of Life to be judged for thee, Heavenly Father. We pray for those people, Heavenly Father, that's had a bad time, especially those people down in Texas, Heavenly Father. We pray for their families, Heavenly Father. We pray for all mankind, and help us always, Heavenly Father, to realize the blessings does not come in dollars and quarters, but they come from thee. Forgive us of our sins, Heavenly Father, and be with us each day. May we live a life, Heavenly Father, that the world may see thee in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You need some help? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. Hang on just a second. I'll be right here. I don't here. know if that was solid wood. But that's... Yeah. 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 Yeah.